Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. My name is Andrea Rodriguez Quiroga. I work with Mark Solms at the Clinical Research Subcommittee of IPA, and I feel very honored to be here today. I would like to thank you all for coming, Virginia Ungar, Sergio Nick for inviting me, and Silvia Weinbuch as chair of the webinars committee for making today's webinar possible. Finally, of course, I would like to thank Dr. Solms for being with us today. This interview is called Neuroscientific Recommendations to Clinicians Practicing Psychoanalysis. It's a topic of great interest and curiosity to me, and I am sure to most of you as well. On the one hand, because it introduces the idea of working interdisciplinary way so as to make the help we offer to our patients more efficient, a central point in our current clinical practice. Dr. Solms, based on neuroscience, believes that our clinical work is greatly enhanced if we use the unregulated feelings which our patients suffer from as the starting point of our analytic work. On the other hand, I immediately recalled, as many of you surely have, the title of Freud's Recommendations for Physicians Practicing Psychoanalysis, dedicated to technical recommendations. In this article, Freud expresses his hope that the increasing experience of psychoanalysts will soon lead to agreement on questions of technique and of most of the effective method of treating neurotic patients. In Mark's case, he used his motivation and interest to offer psychoanalytic treatment to neurological patients, something very unusual some years ago. It is with the same spirit of curiosity that I will carry on this interview with Mark. But before beginning the interview, I will explain briefly the format of how this webinar is going to function. It has two sections. In the first section, the interview, uh, will last almost an hour. The second session is a question and answer portion devoted to the free exchange of selected questions and ideas with Mark. You will find a box entitled questions on the right side of the screen. If you would like to ask a question, please write it in this box. You can post your questions throughout the whole course of the webinar from the very beginning. Please remember that questions will not be answered until after the interview has been completed. Now, I will introduce Professor Mark Soms with a very brief summary of his work. Professor Mark Soms is the Director of Neuropsychology at the Neuroscience Institute of the University of Cape Town. He trained at the British Psychoanalytic Institute but he is now also a member of the South African and the American Psychoanalytic Association. He is chair of the IPA Research Committee. For many years, he has been trying to integrate psychoanalytic and neuroscientific ways of thinking about the mind through an interdisciplinary research effort known as neuropsychoanalysis. He believes that the research effort is now sufficiently far advanced for it to have implications not only for our theory, but also for our practice as psychoanalytic clinicians. That will be the main focus of the questions I'm going to ask him. So let's begin, Mark. The first question. I understand that the incorporation of neuroscience forces us to rethink theory in the mean that repressed predictions cannot be remembered they will be enacted. From the current state of the art of neuroscience, are other psychoanalytic concepts to be revised? Um, thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, so, and, and in order to answer that question, I need to say a few sort of preliminary things. The first is to address the very idea that we in psychoanalysis should be drawing uh, upon findings in another science, uh, in, in this case, the neurosciences. Um, and so I want to remind uh, our colleagues that uh, Freud, uh, when he started the discipline of psychoanalysis, he drew upon 
many ideas from the biology uh, and neuroscience of his time. So he had certain assumptions about how memory works, um, how drives work, uh, how instincts work, um, and uh, how evolution uh, uh, works, for example. And there have been enormous advances in all of those fields. Uh, so it's, uh, Freud would have seen it as entirely not only legitimate but necessary to update those concepts um, where where the where new findings uh, have have uh, have led to new knowledge. So the, the the point that you just made was about repression, um, and and then you said, are there other uh, basic concepts that need revision? Um, because it makes analysts nervous when you start revising uh, our basic concepts, I, I want to also say that it's a matter of opinion how radical these revisions are. In my own view, uh, it's really a matter of clarification um, of a shift of emphasis. Um, it, I, I don't see the, the, the revisions as being that radical. Um, and I think that they just make our theory clearer uh, the theory in particular uh, of, of um, technique. Uh, I think that it enhances our technique uh, to, to, to clarify our theory uh, in the ways that I'm suggesting. So when it comes to repression, um, the, you used the term repressed predictions, um, and I don't, I don't think that uh, all of our colleagues will, will be familiar with, with that concept. So let me say, first of all, just about memory generally that uh, the way that we see memory in, in neuroscience today, to, in, in a very simple phrase, uh, is to say, although memories are about the past, they are for the future. The only reason why we learn uh, is in order to use past experience as a guide to the future. And so it's in that sense that we speak of memories as predictions. Um, in the past, I was able to meet this need in this way, Therefore, in future, um, I'm going to use this way again because it works. Uh, in the past, this way did not work, so I'm not going to use this. So this is what we mean by prediction. So memories of all kinds are fundamentally predictions uh, of, the, of what I must do in the future. Um, and uh, repressed predictions are just a subset of that. In other words, repressed memories. Repressed um, strategies, if you will, as to how, how to meet our needs in the world, how to meet our, what Freud would have called drive needs, uh, how to meet our, our emotional uh, uh, needs in the world. Um, and what we've learned about the memory systems uh, is something which is fundamentally uh, compatible with Freud, that they are what we now call declarative and non-declarative systems. Those are pre-conscious and unconscious. Uh, declarative memories can be brought into consciousness, non-declarative memories cannot. So that's no different from Freud. Uh, what is different from Freud is that we've looked at the non-declarative memory systems, first of all, that there are many subsystems that have a more complex understanding of the unconscious. It's not just one thing, uh, there's a number of different types of unconscious memory. Um, but what they all have in common is that they're not representational. Uh, by, by which I nothing more than uh, that they cannot be represented. You cannot think an unconscious memory. You cannot picture it or imagine it. Um, and so this raises the question, well, it raises many questions, not least of them, then how do you undo repressions if you can't bring them to consciousness? But Freud already addressed this uh, in, in, for example, in relation to the Wolfman. I, I don't want to go into all of the historical details, but I'm, I'm just wanting to make the point, this is not a radical idea that you can't, the, the definition of an unconscious memory as opposed to a pre-conscious one is that it can't be brought to consciousness. And uh, what we've learned in neuroscience is that the reason why we can't bring them to consciousness is because they're not in a representational form. They are not encoded in cortex, which is where images are. They're encoded in subcortical structures. Um, I won't go into the uh, anatomical details, but these structures are action structures. They are, they are in the nature of responses rather than thoughts. So what that means is that we, can, we cannot remember unconscious predictions. We can only enact them. 
So, so how we remember unconsciously is by enacting. It's by it's by the 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 the, the uh, repeating, as Freud would have called it, the repeating of a situation rather than the remembering of it. But that is always the case. It's not possible ever to turn an unconscious memory into a conscious one because it is not in representational form, it's in the form of a motor response. So this is an example of how it clarifies our clinical work. When we're looking for something that's repressed, we're looking for something in the nature of a prediction, and we're looking for something that is enacted. Um, and that, of course, leads to transfer. So there we are with our old theory again, except we now understand it just in a slightly clearer way. Um, and what's more, we understand it in a language that neuroscientists understand. So we can explain to them what we're doing. Uh, so it doesn't look like some weird, you know, um, some strange uh, little world of our own. It's something which is, which is embedded in very good understanding of how memory works. Uh, it also has implications for interpretation because uh, if you can't bring them back to mind, uh, then you know, we really are going down um, a rabbit hole if what we're trying to do is to undo repressions which can't be undone. What we're rather doing is looking at the enactment of repressed predictions so that we can draw the patient's attention in the here and now to look at what you're doing. And then it's a question of why are you doing that? What need is this meant to meet? Uh, and does it work? Uh, and that problematizes it and makes it possible for the patient to rethink. Uh, their, their, their infantile predictions, because remember, repressed predictions were automatically childhood when we don't have the capacity that we have as adults uh, to come up with much better solutions. So it's an undoing of these uh, ossified uh, response uh, uh, patterns, uh, which is why Freud said the unconscious is timeless. It's because it's not updated, because it's automatized, uh, uh, turned into a non-declarative memory. Uh, long, long ago. Um, now you ask me, what else? What other than the theory of repressed predictions? What other uh, 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 ways do we need to revise basic concepts? And uh, they are not remain anxious. It's, it's, they are uh, not radical revisions, but it's, um, the, 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 one of them is that repression is not the same as defense. Um, Freud uh, initially used these terms interchangeably. Then he discovered other defense mechanisms. And then uh, under the influence, particularly of his daughter, um, he started to think of repression as just one among many mechanisms of defense. But that's, uh, that, that's um, the, the, the problem with that uh, is that unlike uh, repressed predictions, which are non-representational, defenses can be thought about. So in our technique, you can say to the patient, can you see that you're doing this in order not to feel that? And they say, yes, I, yes, I know, but I've got no choice. In other words, they can see and think about um, their defenses in a way that they can't ever bring to mind uh, in, in, in the sense of remembering uh, representationally uh, a, a, a repressed prediction. Uh, there's much more that could be said about that. But what I'm saying is the, the one other thing that needs revision is the idea that Repression is just a mechanism of defense. It's in fact, repression comes first, then it inevitably does not meet the underlying need. That's what a repressed prediction is. It's a prediction that's been automatized prematurely or illegitimately. It does not solve the problem that overwhelmed the child. So, that, so, so they're doomed to repeat um, a way of trying to uh, uh, tackle a situation which doesn't work. Therefore, the need does not go away. In Freudian terms, the drive demand is not met, so the affect remains. So the patient continues to suffer from the affect, but they now no longer know what it's about uh, because the, the, the underlying cause of that affect, in other words, what they're doing, has become unconscious and automatized. Then we institute defenses against those affects. Defenses are against affects. They're second order of things, um, and it's when the defenses fail uh, that the patient falls ill. So um, I, I must be careful not to speak too much, but just very, very briefly, in addition, uh, we have to revise the theory of the drives. Um, the, the, there's been enormous advances uh, in the neurobiology of drive, and uh, we need to 
we need to bring this into psychoanalysis. It's very, very valuable knowledge. Um, and because it was always the most uncertain part of Freudian theory, he himself said, you know, he really wasn't sure how to go about classifying the drive. We need to wait for biology to answer these questions, and biology has. So psychoanalysts, many, have lost faith in drive theory altogether. But you can't have a psychoanalysis without a drive theory. It's the connection between the mind and the body. Indeed, sexuality itself is part of drive theory. We can't do without a drive theory. So if we've, those of us who've abandoned Freudian drive theory have ended up abandoning drive theory altogether. What we need is a revised drive theory. And so that's an enormous uh, body of knowledge which I can just allude to. Uh, lastly, uh, in discovering the brain mechanisms of drive, uh, we, to our great surprise, have found not only that the brain mechanisms that generate drives uh, also generate affects. In other words, it's one and the same mechanism. The, the drive and the affect are the same thing. You feel the drive. Um, not only have we found that, but the part of the brain that generates drive is the part of the brain that generates all consciousness. So consciousness in its fundamental form is drive. Uh, it's, this is what gets the mind going. Uh, uh, and, and consciousness is feeling. Secondarily, it becomes a, a, a consciousness of ideas. So that leads to a need to, um, to distinguish between what Freud called the id and what, and what Freud called the system unconscious. The system unconscious is a memory system. The id is a drive system, and drives are not unconscious. I know this sounds like heresy to a psychoanalyst, but just think um, of hunger, the simplest form of drive. Who ever heard of a hunger that you don't feel? You know, I mean, what is hunger if you don't feel it? The hunger is the drive. The feeling is the drive. And the same applies to all drives. Um, uh, think of uh, something like respiratory control. You know, we breathe automatically, unconsciously all the time. Uh, but if you get a blockage in your throat or there's a carbon dioxide filled room, suddenly this comes to consciousness in the form of what we call a, a suffocation alarm. And that makes a very big difference to what you do. The coming to consciousness is, is turning an, autom 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 an autonomic need into a demand upon the mind to perform work. And that's what a drive is. A drive is when something auto, 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 autonomic becomes volitional. So that's a, a very broad overview of the sorts of basic concepts that need revision. I can't, I can't hear you, Andrea. I'm happy to know that there are not so radical revisions. <laughs> But uh, you stated earlier that the id is in fact conscious. Can you please explain the links between consciousness and intentionality? Yes, sure. Um, well, in fact, I'll go back to the example I just gave um, of respiratory control. As I said, um, we are th there is an autonomic process, an unconscious process whereby we breathe. Uh, and regulated by an unconscious monitoring of our blood gases. There's a, there's a range with of oxygen and carbon dioxide has to be made. And if you go out of that range, then we have suffocation alarm. And that's when um, air hunger or, 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 or that feeling, that drive, comes to consciousness. Then it becomes a drive. It drives you to do something. And so what and it's a very interesting question. Think about it. Why should it become conscious at that point? It's precisely because you don't know what to do. When there's certainty, you can, you can rely upon automaticity. You can just relegate it to your autonomic nervous system. I'm breathing. I don't need to think about it because there's, not, there's no choices to be made. But once you're in a carbon dioxide filled room, there's a fire. Uh, you, you, you don't know what to do. So you have to make voluntary choices. You have to decide, should I go this way or should I go that way? Should I go up or should I go down? And the way in which you know is how it feels. The conscious feeling of, yeah, I can breathe. I'm going that way. You know, that's why we have consciousness. Consciousness tells you how you're doing. Uh, 
within a biological scale of values. Th that those values being whatever enhances survival and reproductive success is good. So the way that we feel what is biologically good is it feels pleasurable. And what is biologically bad feels unpleasurable. We only need to feel that when we need to make choices. In fact, you could not make choices without feeling, without a value system. Um, otherwise, it would be random. There has to be some way of knowing subjectively of the, of, of the, of the, the, the person to know, how am I doing? Is this better? Is this worse? Uh, and then you have to make, so feelings are the basis upon which we make those choices. And this is why consciousness evolved at all. Consciousness is, as I said earlier, fundamentally feeling. Um, and feeling enables us to make choices. So that's the relationship between consciousness and intentionality. In fact, I've just written a book about it. While I'm, while I'm talking to so many people, let me plug my book. It's coming out in February. It's called The Hidden Spring. It's about consciousness. Thank you, Mark. Uh, um, I think, or I understand that having a clear idea of the patient's feelings during the initial interviews can help improve the course of treatment. How do you imagine that this could be included in the training program? Oh, well, um, so um, le let, me, let me divide your question into two parts. And first of all, explain what I mean by feelings being a guide. Um, and then I'll address the question about the training program. Um, if you, building on what I've just been saying, um, what feelings are it is an announcement in consciousness of a need, and a need that's not being met. So um, if the need is being met, you can just behave automatically like a zombie, and everything's unconscious. Um, if the need is not being met, it comes to consciousness in the form of a feeling, which is the drive. Uh, as, as I've said uh, earlier. Um, so if, if, if a patient is suffering from a feeling, it means they're suffering from an unmet need. Uh, and I, I used bodily examples earlier um, of, of hunger and, uh, and suffocation alarm, but the same applies to emotional needs. They work in exactly the same way. So that, for example, um, where we, we need to be safe, we need to not be under threat from predators. Uh, if we are, we feel fear. That means, you know, you need to be here, but you're not. You deviated from there. And that is the drive demand. It's, the, it's what Freud called a measure of the demand on the mind for work. That measure is the drive. And you feel it. So the more in danger you are, the more anxious you are, fearful. Um, so that's an emotional need, a need to be safe from a, a, a danger to life and limb. Um, so it's just like hunger, it's homeostatic, but it has to do with emotional needs. Likewise, separation distress. I need to keep my caregiver close to me. Uh, if she uh, abandons me, if 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 I'm if I'm uh, 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 if I if I lose her, uh, then I feel panic, separation distress, uh, and I need to I need to, um, uh, to 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 find a way, a prediction uh, of how to get mummy back again. So these are emotional drives. They're exactly the same as bodily ones. Um, and the point of it is that which feeling your patient suffers from, if it's fear, it means they're trying to get away from something and whatever they're doing isn't working. Um, if it's panic, uh, then they're trying to establish reunion with their love object and whatever it is that they're doing isn't working. This is why they're suffering from panic. Despair, you know, means that they've lost, not that they're trying to establish reunion, but that they have lost their love object. And so I'm using very simple examples in order to make the point. But the, the, the fact is our patients suffer from feelings. And like my children told me when, when they were little, uh, they said that their father is a doctor of feelings. That's what we are. We deal with emotional disorders. Our patients suffer consciously from feelings. They just don't know where those feelings come from. Where they come from is from the repressed predictions. In other words, the things that they're repetitively doing, which are meant to meet those needs, but which are not meeting those needs. Um, so this is why feelings are such an important guide to our work. First of all, because they're conscious. Uh, secondly, because the patient 
themselves think that's why they're coming to you. They, they, our patients don't say, uh, doctor, there's something I'm unconscious of. Will you please tell me what it is? Uh, they say, I I'm only too conscious of this feeling. Can you please take it away? So if we, if we see it the same way, uh, that what we're trying to do is understand this feeling, that's the problem. Uh, then we have the sort of basis of a therapeutic alliance right there. Um, but more importantly, it, the, the quality of the feeling identifies which emotional drive is not being met. Um, and so if, to go back to the examples I've just been using, if the quality of the feeling is panicky separation distress, as for example, we see with borderline patients so often, um, this means I must look in the transference for what is the patient doing repeatedly, um, which is causing this panicky feeling. Th that connection is not in the consciousness of the patient, but it's a guide to the transference for us that we now know not I must look to transference, but I must look to transference with the expectation that what I'm going to find there is something the patient is doing unconsciously, enacting, repeating uh, uh, compulsively, uh, which is in the nature of something which is meant to bring my love object attention uh, and care back. So it helps us to see more clearly what the transference is. Uh, so th that's the uh, first part of your question. The second part I can answer much, much quicker. It's, it's simply that you say, well, how does this affect our training? I'm sorry to say uh, b b how it affects our training is that we mustn't just learn Freudian drive theory. Freudian drive, I love Freud. I'm a Freudian. I've spent my life studying, translating, uh, and, and extending Freud's ideas. I think Freud's a genius. Um, Freud would be very happy to know that his intellectual descendants are revising his ideas, especially drive theory. He was so uncertain about it precisely because it's a biological theory. He said many times the answers to this have to come from biology. So we need to teach our candidates uh, and indeed our colleagues about the advances in the neurobiology of drive. Um, just to give you the, 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 the quickest um, uh, indication, there are not two emotional drives. There are seven. So, you know, Freud always saw it as a duality between two types of drive, initially self-preservative and libidinal, and then later between life and death drives, because um, there's conflict. But uh, the, the, why must the conflict be between only two drives? What neuroscience has taught us is that there's even more room for conflict, because there are seven competing, you know, in many respects, irreconcilable in themselves drives. And the whole task of mental development, is to, of ego development, is to learn not only how to meet each one of these needs, um, emotional needs, but also how to reconcile them with each other. Um, so simply put, we need to teach our candidates what we know about the drives. Um, and it started with Freudian drive theory, then there were revisions, even, even uh, shortly after Freud's death, uh, with Fairbairn uh, and Bowlby, that they started to question, uh, is attachment really just part of libidinal drive? Um, they said it's not. Uh, experimental work in monkeys and human children uh, in the 60s um, uh, proved, proved it's a separate drive. Um, and the same sort of work has been done uh, in, 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 in a broader way uh, in neurobiology since Bowlby's time. And we have, we have, in fact, there are two attachment drives in the brain, uh, and they are separate from, from, from the sexual drive, anatomically separate, chemically separate. Uh, and, you know, we have absolutely solid knowledge um, where we can experimentally demonstrate this. Um, and, uh, the, and as I say, there are, there are, in fact, many more. So to know about these basic emotional needs of our patients uh, is fundamentally valuable knowledge. Uh, for psychoanalysts and for for psychoanalytic candidates. So we, we the, the 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 big problem is can our institutes bring themselves uh, to teach drive theory not just historically but also in terms of what we know today. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, you know, um, two things uh, I have. Uh, to, to let you know that there is a handout that you can download from the control panel. Uh, it's a handout that Mark 
uh, sent to us. So if you if you will like to do this, it will be easier if you are not aware of all the um, theory. Next question. Um, could you give us an example um, of how the transference interpretation unfolds over the four steps you work with? Yes. Um, well, let me, first of all, I seem to be dividing all your questions into two parts. Um, so let me first of all tell uh, our colleagues what these four steps are, and then I'll give you an example. Okay. Um, actually, actually, before I give you the four steps, um, I want to remind you that I am teaching you. Uh, uh, this is a webinar. You know, it's it's not a psychoanalytic session. So I'm not making interpretations to a patient when I tell you this is how I do it. Okay, I wouldn't use these words. These are didactic words. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm teaching uh, the, the four, but one doesn't actually sit there behind the couch and think step one, step two, step three, step four. You know, uh, all of those things go without saying. So what a transference interpretation entails four steps, not made in this way. Over time, you have to cover all four steps. The first is to say, not in these words, to say to the patient, can you see you doing this thing over and over again? So showing the patient, uh, this is the pattern that they're repeating. And by the way, transference is not something subtle. Oh, let me also say, transference is not only to the analyst. Uh, th this is a misunderstanding. Uh, the, the, if you go back to Freud, you see transference is simply the enactment of repressed uh, 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 memories, uh, what we nowadays call repressed predictions. In other words, um, it's it can be you repeat those predictions with your analyst, but also with your spouse and your boss and your friends. You know, uh, it's transference isn't only something that happens in the consulting room. It's a and as I say, it's a robust thing. It's not hard to see what pattern of you know. Once you get, get to know a patient, you see this is the thing that they do. They always do this thing. So step one is to say to the patient, can you see the pattern? Can you see you doing this? In other words, enacting this over and over again. Secondly, uh, can you see this is what it's meant to achieve? So this goes back to what I was saying earlier, that uh, the prediction, the, the, the enactment is, is, is a prediction as to how to meet a particular need. So it's saying to the patient, can you see this is the to use your earlier word, intentionality. This is this is what this this um, this behavior is meant to achieve. Number three, can you see it doesn't work? It's not achieving that goal. Um, and number four, can you see that's why you're suffering from this feeling? So again, remember the tone of voice and the words I'm using now are didactic. I don't talk to my patients like that, but this is what we have to do. Can you see that you're doing this over and again? Can you see it's meant to achieve this uh, outcome? Can you see, thirdly, it's not achieving that outcome? Can you see, lastly, that's why you feel like this? Um, uh, so to go to a, an example um, to illustrate uh, those points, let's say I, I said earlier, panicky anxieties are what borderline patients so often suffer from. So let's use an example of that kind. Uh, a patient is constantly getting themselves into disasters. It's a catastrophe. There's always a catastrophe. And that's the pattern, you know, that they're causing, that, well, they don't think they could, they don't know they're causing it, but you can see it. They, what they're repeating is getting themselves into crises all the time. So now you think, and the patient suffers from panicky anxiety. So going back to what I've said, so you start with this, this patient is suffering from this feeling, separation distress, panic. OK, that means they're doing something which is meant to meet that need, which is not working. Now I look to the transference and I see, ah, what they're doing is getting into catastrophes all the time. So then the question is, so how does this, how is this meant to meet that need? Um, and by the way, you don't only go to transference, you also go to the history. The history helps you to explain the transference. So the, going to the history, to the past, uh, is not therapeutic in itself. I cannot emphasize that enough. So, so many uh, lay people in particular think, you know, that remembering is what psychoanalysis is for. And as, as if remembering the past is somehow going to make it better. You can't change the past. You can only change the present. 
So you go via the past to the present, to the transference, to understand why the patient's doing this. So in our example, this example that I've just started using, um, the question is, how is this, uh, uh, this creation of crises uh, meant to bring the caregiver's attention? Ah, well, you know, you know from the history, this, say, for example, you know, that when she got very ill or when she had an accident, uh, then her mum did pay attention to her. So this is her childish prediction. And by the way, that's another important thing to remember. Repressed predictions are childish. You know, they're, they're actually quite, quite silly, really. You know, you mustn't expect something too sophisticated. It's the way a child would think. So it, the child overwhelmed by the fact that their mother doesn't attend to them. Their, mother's, uh, their mother keeps separating. Their mother keeps abandoning them. Uh, but then they find, well, when I'm really sick, then mother does look after me, so this becomes my prediction. I must be in a crisis so that I can get mum's attention. So you say to the patient, can you see you're always getting yourself into crises? Uh, can you see this is meant to bring you love and care and attention? And can you see it isn't working? Because, by the way, childish solutions like that don't work. You know, what actually happens is one thinks, oh, for God's sake, there she goes again. You know, what, what happens in these, in, in these kinds of situations? And can you see this is why you're feeling panicky all the time? This is why you feel you losing uh, the love and care that you want all the time. It's because that thing that you're doing doesn't work. Uh, it's not the best way to do it. Then you don't teach the patient a new way to do it. You've just problematized it. You've brought it back into declarative, uh, the, the sphere of the mind where the patient can make those choices I was talking about earlier in consciousness. And then uh, with their adult mind, with your help, I mean, you're not a teacher, but you, you're there to point out what they're doing where, you know, when, when they defend, make, kidding themselves and so on. They can rethink the situation and find a better solution. But, uh, well, I've answered your question. I, I, I tend to talk too much. So one of the symptoms that analysts suffer from is because we have to be quiet all the time behind the couch. Uh, <laughs> we get a chance to speak, we speak. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, in your experience these days, um, have you observed changes in the way emotional drive needs and unregulated feelings at the consulting rooms due to uncertainty and delay as mortal enemies of predictive systems? Um, I think the crucial part of what you're saying is the business of delay and uncertainty. Um, uh, 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 I mean, you're touching, you're asking good questions, Andrea which are hard to answer succinctly because they, your questions are cutting to the heart of the matter. Um, the, let me preface my answer by saying again, everything that I'm saying is not radically new. Okay, it's, I'm using a language derived from the neurosciences for the reasons I said, it enables us to take on board what they've learned uh, and to translate it into what, what we do. Um, and, vice versa, by the way, also to take what we've learned and and teach it to them, because there's a hell of a lot that we've got to teach neuroscientists about how the mind works. But if you if you speak a language that nobody understands, uh, then, you know, you, you, it's like Babel. It's better that we all call the same thing by the same word. But it's not just a matter of new words. It's new knowledge and the new knowledge derived by new methods. You know, so once you use neuroscientific um, uh, terms, you can make use of neuroscientific methods to test our theories. That's incredibly important, you know, that there, there are things that we that you couldn't do in 1900 or 1920 or 1939, uh, which you now can do. So it's not just language. It's also uh, exposing our theories to the best methods available to, to, to test them and, and thereby to develop them. Um, so, Freud, the question of delay that you're raising there, uh, it was fundamental to Freudian theory. The distinction between primary process and secondary process is all about delay. Um, and Freud had quaint ideas about free energies and bound energies and all of that, you know, which came from the, the psychophysics uh, and biophysics of his day. Um, but we, 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 the, those very same things, we've learned a lot about it uh, in, in, in neuroscience. Um, so, um, the difference, remember I spoke earlier of declarative and non-declarative memory systems. 
uh, well, a fundamental distinction between those two systems uh, is that the declarative memories can be brought into consciousness, which we nowadays call working memory. And it's a very nice term, working memory. It's also called short-term memory. Uh, it's, it's taking the long-term declarative memories and bringing them into consciousness so that you can think about them. Uh, and the importance of being able to think about them is that you can change your mind. This thing I said about choice. Consciousness is all about choice. That's what it's there for. Uh, in fact, there was a lovely phrase Freud used. He said, consciousness arises instead of a memory trace. In other words, uncertainty of consciousness arises instead of the certainty of, a predict of an unconscious prediction. So an unconscious prediction is just automatically repeated. Uh, by being able to bring the thing into consciousness, uh, you can, you can, you can, it becomes labile again. Um, this is the, the term that's used. Um, and it's no longer a prediction. It's now up for grabs. You know, you're thinking about it. But this takes time. So when you have to make choices, when you have to deliberate, when you have to think, uh, it takes time, um, which biologically speaking is dangerous. Um, we're, we're, it's, it's not only dangerous, it's expensive in all sorts of ways. It's metabolically expensive, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, think about it where our, our mental instrument evolved in a world very different from the world we're living now, where you, they, they were constant. Uh, you know, it, was, it was literally a jungle. You know, and uh, survival uh, uh, is a matter of you know, quick decisions. You can't think, mm, there's a lion coming for me. I want, let's just think about this and see what might happen here. Uh, we have automatic response patterns, um, which are instinctual reflexes to begin with, but instinctual reflexes are not enough. Um, they're too simple. They, 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 they can't deal with, con with context. Um, so uh, this is why we have new learning and why we have declarative memory is so that we can feel our way through new contexts and find better ways, more nuanced and sophisticated and flexible ways um, of meeting our needs. But um, while you're not sure, you're, there's delay and there's all the dangers and costs that come with it. This is why we automatize. There's an enormous imperative to automatize our predictions uh, for reasons that I hope are, are, are by now obvious in, in what I'm saying. Um, so generally speaking, automatization um, is, is a good thing. The difference, remember what I said earlier, between repressed predictions and other automatized predictions is that the repressed ones are illegitimately automatized or prematurely automatized because the child can't come up with anything better at that time. So they automat they cut their losses. It's not a bad thing. Uh, then it wasn't a bad thing, but it doesn't mean that forevermore uh, that's the only solution you can come up with. It's a rigid, ossified, uh, stereotyped uh, thing. So your your question about the the the, the delays um, and the mortal dangers that come with delay uh, speaks to this to this whole issue. Um, it's why we automatize is it, what, for, as Freud said, primary process. It's boom, 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 boom. Secondary process is mm, let me think. Um, and why don't we just keep everything in secondary process then? It's for the reason that I've just said. Uh, and it, I hope you can see it really is, it sounds new. It, uh, we, we've learned a lot extra uh, and we can test it experimentally using neuroscientific methods, uh, et cetera. But, Basically, it's an old Freudian idea. It's not. It's not something so so radical. Well, I like your idea. It's not so radical. <laughs> um, do you think that the insights gained from neuroscientific approach can contribute to increase knowledge about the mechanisms of change in psychoanalysis? Yes, I do. Um, uh, look. Everything we've been talking about, uh, and there's a red thread through what we, there are several, but one of the red threads running through what we've been talking about um, is this idea that you can't undo repressions for the reasons I've said. So the, the classical idea, and when I say classical, I mean early Freud. It was only the early Freud who thought like this. We forget that. When Freud treated um, the patients in the clinical studies uh, 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 with Breuer, uh, you know, the, uh, he said, uh, 
this, I'm just using one example, but the patient, uh, when her sister died, um, she fell ill uh, with a, with a, a hysterical uh, uh, paralysis that she, 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 she couldn't get out of bed. Uh, and Freud uh, works out that it's because um, she lusted after her brother-in-law. And so she thought when her sister died, oh, good, now I can get him. You know? And then it's like, oh, my God, it's terrible, boom, out of mind. That's what Freud called repression in 1895. Uh, the mature Freud wouldn't have called that repression. You don't have repressions happening when you're 35 years old. Um, he would have seen that as a transference. That itself would have been a transference from a deeper repressed prediction having to do with who you may and may not lust after, you know, uh, from childhood. Um, so when Freud was able to recover these memories, uh, he said he's undoing repressions, uh, but we wouldn't call it that these days. Uh, Freud never said uh, what, you, what you do in analysis is recover the memories uh, of your Oedipus complex. I mean, how many of us how many of our patients have remembered the Oedipus complex? Remembered it? Oh, thanks for pointing it out. Gosh, I forgot. You know, yes, and now I remember. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. So the, the mechanism of change in psychoanalysis is not undoing repressions. It's not possible to undo repressions. And so we must be doing something else. Uh, we're not doing what the old theory said we're doing. So what are we doing? Um, and uh, this, is, this is your question. You know, how does this knowledge our understanding uh, of uh, of the the, the 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 therapeutic mechanism of psychoanalysis. Um, well, I've told you what we do, and again, you know, this is just a clarification because, in fact, it's what we do anyway. It's just not what we what our theory says we're doing. But what we're doing is interpreting transference. That's not bringing back the repressed prediction. It's drawing to the patient's attention what they're doing now. That they can think about because they're doing it now. You know, so it's here and now, which is why if it happens in the consulting room, it's even better. So it's drawing the patient's attention to their, to their repressed prediction in the way I said earlier, you know, that you're doing this and this is why you're doing it. And it's, can you see it's, the outcome isn't what you expect it to be. And that's why you're feeling like this. This, this doing this, is transference interpretation, which makes it possible for the patient to formulate a new prediction and then slowly consolidate it. And that's the part that I want to emphasize. This last sentence I used about slowly consolidated. Consolidation, by the way, and automatization, that's the same process. Uh, it's how things become unconscious. And um, the, the, because we can't undo repressions, um, even when you make the patient aware of what they're doing in the transference. It doesn't take away the prediction. It stays there, it goes away. Anyway, this is why these can, you know, they you can get better and you can get go back to your old bad ways because your old bad ways never disappear. The the uncon as Freud said, it's timeless. These are indelible memories. Uh, but as you, ooh, what am I seeing? Something on my screen here. Ignore. I'm going to ignore. Um, it, um, um, so when, when you make the interpretation to the patient, they see it. They see the truth of what you're saying. Um, but that doesn't take away the repressed prediction also. So that is why, even though the patient genuinely saw the truth of what you were saying, uh, and they, it really means a great deal to them because their suffering starts to make sense. And what is more, they see it's in their own hands. Something can be done about this. It can be done differently. Even though all of that happens, still come the next session, the patients stand again. They do it again and again because we have prediction people there. To the patient's attention, in all these different contexts, remember what I said, that a c conscious memory is for, con is for changing context. So you have to make the patient aware you did it there and there and there and there over and over again. This we call working through. Um, and so the process of working through is terribly important uh, as, as part. So I've said the mechanism of change in psychoanalysis is not undoing repressions. Uh, it's not making the repressed unconscious
that can't happen. What it is, is transference information, which is making the patient aware in the here and now of what they're doing and why, so that they can rethink it and come up with a new solution. But then they need to consolidate that new solution. And that takes time. Working through takes time. This is why we have frequent and numerous sessions. Any healthcare funder who wants quicker treatments uh, when it comes to this part of the brain, these subcortical memory systems, they need to learn how learning works. You know, it's like saying we want we want kidney dialysis once a year. You know, you can't. That's not how the kidney works. The patient will die. So when it comes to these unconscious memory systems, uh, these these non-declarative subcortical memory systems, we say in cognitive neuroscience those kinds of predictions are hard to learn and hard to forget. Okay, so it takes time. Uh, this is working through. Um, so transference interpretation is no more important than working through. Uh, and uh, there's one last thing I will say about therapeutic uh, change is that there are other mechanisms too. Um, not everything that goes into the non-declarative systems comes via the declarative systems. You can learn non-declaratively directly. Um, so if I can use an example from my own analysis, um, my analyst, who I liked very much and who helped me very much, uh, he had a limp. Uh, and uh, sometime into my analysis, my wife said to me, why are you limping? And uh, she was right, I was limping, just my analyst. Now, never did him and I discuss his limp. I mean, it, I, I, I never. what I mean is I never said to him, you know, uh, Dr. York, I like you very much and I, I want to be like you, uh, so I'm going to start limping. It, it never came through consciousness. It just went straight into, and it wasn't just wanting to be like him, it's also wanting to have him present in the form of, you know, introjection and identification and all of that. But the important issue is it didn't come through declarative memory. There was no interpretation. It just happened. And that is also part of what happens in analysis that we, there is a direct uh, a process of um, non-declarative learning in the analysis uh, alongside. But I think that by far the most important mechanisms are the ones that I mentioned first. That is to say, transference interpretation and working through of the transference. Thank you, Mark. Um, I want to ask you if the effectiveness of these recommendations you are giving us have been tested in process or, or outcome studies, uh, and if this can help to narrow the gap between clinicians and researchers. Yes, um, well, so I'll tell you something interesting. I mean, first of all, let me say, because all of these things we discuss. It, it, uh, especially when you start asking questions like that about empirical findings, um, it's not something you yeah. can summarize in a few sentences. You know, there's a vast literature, um, and analysts don't read that literature. So, what's what you're saying about the gap between clinicians and researchers? Um, so, let me say first of all, I wrote an, a very short summary paper um, about this whole topic that you've just asked me about. It's in the British Journal of Psychiatry, and it's, um, it's also important writing for psychiatrists um, about what we what we do in psycho. It's, it's very important that we don't only talk to ourselves and don't only listen to ourselves, um, as they say um, in other contexts about social media. The danger of echo chambers, you know, where uh, it's all you hear is what you thought in the first place. Um, we must. We need to uh, have a have a have a dialogue with 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 the rest of the mental science sciences and, and mental scientists and mental practitioners. Uh, we don't have a monopoly of, of knowledge. Um, but in the British Journal of Psychiatry, I wrote a paper called, in the international edition. Uh, uh, so you can just Google it. It's called the Scientific Standing of Psychoanalysis, and that summarizes this whole literature. But what I want to tell you is that in, in that paper, you'll see all the, it's a review of all of the literature. It's, so it's my paper is like a funnel into, uh, then you can follow up whatever interests you. But what I show there is the empirical evidence for everything I've just told you. Uh, in other words, that um, 
what is therapeutic is to focus on feelings. And this is not an idea, it's empirically studied. In other words, uh, you take uh, video recordings of psychotherapy sessions uh, and, you, and the blind rater, in other words, somebody who doesn't know what your hypothesis is, uh, ticks every time the analyst says something about the patient's feelings. Okay, and uh, then they measure at the end the outcome. And then they see what predicts therapeutic outcome and they find one of them is a focus on affects. Okay, another one is a focus on transference, um, and you know, et cetera. So, so making links between the past and the present in the form of transference interpretations and focusing on affects these are the best predictors of therapeutic uh, uh, change. And interestingly, the, the research that shows this shows that this is not only true of psychoanalysis, uh, it's true of cognitive behavioral therapy too. In other words, the cognitive behavioral therapists who have the best outcomes, uh, even though their theory tells them they're doing something else, it's in fact the ones who focus on affect and on the relationship between patient and therapist uh, and the linking of that to the, to the childhood past, uh, these are the things that predict change. Um, so there's, yes, there's very good um, empirical evidence uh, that, that these are, that the, 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 the things that we've talked about in this webinar, um, they're not, that's not only that they um, are validated in terms of that is actually how memory systems work, that is actually how, what is, how consciousness versus unconsciousness works, that is in fact how drives work, etc. It's not only a matter of the mechanisms in and of themselves of how the mind works, but also the mechanisms of therapeutic change, uh, that, that these are empirically uh, 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 verified to be. But now, of course, uh, you know, that's an ongoing field. So the whole business of studying um, the, uh, um, the process and mechanism of therapeutic change in psychoanalysis. I mean, what could be more important to us practicing analysts? And yet, as I said earlier, you know, we don't we, we don't even know about that literature. So we're we're doing things um, in the American Psychoanalytic Association. Um, uh, I'm the director of their science department, and in the IPA, as you said in your introduction, I'm the chair of the research committee. And what we're doing, we have done it in APSA, and now we're about to do it in the IPA, is we're starting a college of research fellows, whereby non-clinicians, researchers, uh, can be acknowledged by and valued by uh, international psychoanalysis in the form of the IPA, so that we can start to try and break down these barriers. And in fact, the research committee has a conference every year, uh, uh, which is, uh, uh, as you know, Andrea, um, with a format of which is that we have clinicians commenting on researchers' work and researchers commenting on clinician work. And I think that that's a fantastic model uh, for, for how we should um, proceed and how we will progress uh, as a discipline. Researchers so, are not the enemy. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mark. Uh, unless you you think that you can say something else or you want to say something else that can help clinicians, we we will move to the audience uh, questions because there are a huge amount of questions for yeah. you. Uh, no, in that case, uh, uh, I'm very happy. Well, in fact, I'll just say a footnote to the answer I just gave you, which is okay. that the I and APSA are funding a study, well, we have given seed funding um, because these sorts of studies need much more than the IPA or APSA can afford. But if we give the pilot funding, then they can get uh, funding from the, from the uh, bigger uh, funding uh, bodies. But we gave seed funding to a, a study which I think many of our members would be interested to know. It's, it's led by Mariana leutzinger Berleber. And it's looking at the question of session frequency. Uh, so you were asking about empirical uh, studies of, of, of the mechanisms and processes of change. And uh, this, this thing, which has become such a political, uh, ideological question in the IPA, uh, we address it, we're wanting to address it empirically, to have a look at not only does increased session frequency lead to better outcomes, but also, and you know, it's an open question, who knows? Uh, and also, does it lead to different processes? 
uh, what kind of process happens uh, and which of those processes um, uh, 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 therapeutic change and so on. So I, I, I think it's important to mention uh, this because um, the IPA and APSA are funding that study. That means our membership dues on these research projects. And this is why I'm, I'm wanting to make uh, to, to emphasize, you know, how important it is for our field to address scientifically questions like what's the difference between four times a week and two times a week, you know, et cetera. So let's go to the to the to the questions from, from our colleagues. Okay, uh, Mark, I will need to ask you if you can shut down your camera because you have some sound problems so that people can hear okay. you better. So I must shut the camera. Yes, please. Okay, is that so, better? Yes, I think so. Uh, we cannot um, ask you the, the, the whole questions because there are too many, but um, here comes the first one. Could you could you explain? Is there a link between the basic emotions and mentalization? Um, well, in a way, in a way, that's what I've been saying. So let me just first of all translate for for our uh, colleagues. Uh, basic emotions, um, in the sense that I'm using the word, are no different from our drives. Okay, so so uh, attachment drives give rise to feelings of panicky separation anxiety and feelings of nurture and care. These are two basic emotions. Um, and I spoke of fear, this sexuality, this play is a basic emotion, etc. Um, so th this is what so basic emotions are: basic emotional needs. That is to say, drives. Um, and you're saying, is there a connection between this and mentalization? Well, what I was saying about transference interpretation um, is precisely about mentalization. In other words, it's something which is automatic uh, and reflexive and stereotyped, which does not come to the mind, it's not mentalized, uh, is exactly what repressed predictions are. Um, and so making, bringing the, this to the patient's awareness in other words, bringing to their awareness what they are unconsciously doing um, in order to meet their basic emotional needs, bringing this to awareness is to make them mentalizable. Uh, so uh, these are just um, f uh, terms that people have become familiar with, um, which, uh, and one of the dangers of familiar terms is we forget what they mean. You know that we just sort of use them as as as, uh, as as empty words, but it's exactly what I've been talking about. Yes, indeed, there's a deep connection between those two things. Thank you, Mark. Here's a question. It says, "What about existential feelings? They are frequently brought to analysis, sense of life, mission in life, some kind of transcendence." Is that an enormous transformation of the primary emotions that meet needs they have gone through? As an analyst, how do you deal with them? With love, joy? So, um, again, I want to remind you, remind us all, uh, that everything that I'm saying is, although I'm using a language uh, derived from another discipline, um, for the reasons I've said, um, that in fact these are things which are not radically new to psychoanalysis. It's it's just a, it's just an elaboration. It's just a clarification, uh, etc. Now, therefore, uh, I want to say this: the the idea that spiritual concerns, higher existential concerns, um, etc. Um, the the idea that these can be uh, ultimately reduced to much more basic. Um, urges and and uh, motivations um, is an old Freudian idea, and so my answer to this question is in fact is simply a restatement of what we've always known. Of course, in our actual conscious life, um, we are concerned with very subtle, very abstract, uh, intellectual, philosophical, existential questions. But when you analyze them you find that behind those questions lie much more basic things. 
like for example just uh, this is just hypothetical i don't mean that it's always the case but existential concerns behind them frequently lie separation concerns um you know questions of 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 um what's going to happen to me when i'm dead um they sound like philosophical questions but it's really like you know is there any going is, is any going anybody going to be looking after me you know i'm going to be completely and utterly abandoned forevermore in oblivion so we find um, uh, that the, the, a knowledge of the basic emotional drives, of which I keep on telling you there are seven, um, that, that this doesn't mean that these are the only emotions, um, that they, are, they get elaborated cognitively, as we've always known. So, for example, um, one of the basic uh, emotional drives is rage. Uh, another one of the basic emotional drives, which I've spoken about so often, is attachment. Um, so these are two basic emotions, the separation um, distress on the one hand and rage, frustrated, irritated rage on the other. Um, rage, uh, the instinctual response to rage is attack and destroy, get rid of the bastard, you know, the thing that's the obstacle that's in your way. Uh, the instinctual prediction uh, attaching to uh, separation distress is cry out and search for her, try to, try to bring her back again. Now, what happens if you have both of those feelings toward the same person, um, which is not unusual, you know, mummy frustrates you, uh, so you have rageful feelings toward her. Out of that conflict between two basic drives comes guilt. So guilt is not a basic emotion. Uh, it's, a, it's a resultant of, a, of the mind trying to, the ego trying to deal with um, with uh, these two conflicting um, id demands. And uh, so something as absolutely ubiquitous as guilt turns out to be something that can be analyzed into two component parts. It's aim-inhibited aggression, as Freud said. Guilt is the rage turned away from the love object uh, back upon the subject uh, in order to deal with the with the conflict arising from that ambivalence. And the same applies to jealousy, the same applies to shame, the same applies to pride and so on. These very common um, uh, envy too, these are not basic emotions, but they're, but they're very common. And then higher than that are even more abstracted secondary emotions uh, of the kind you, you're talking about, like for example, existential concerns. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, there are a lot of questions. Um, could you describe briefly the relationship of repressed predictions and dreams? Uh, well, the funny part of that is the word briefly. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, as, as some of the uh, colleagues may know, I have studied brain mechanisms of dreaming uh, more than anything else that I've, that I've done. I mean, my my earliest research already in the 1990s, um, I was studying brain mechanisms of dreaming, um, and um, the early stages of what has come to be known as neuropsychoanalysis were attempts to translate. They were descriptive attempts. In other words, which brain structures and functions perform uh, uh, the, the 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 mental uh, functions and structures that Freud uh, spoke of. So, for example, what is the system unconscious? Where is it in the brain? What is pre-conscious in the brain? What is conscious in the brain? What is repression in the brain? What is the id in the brain? Where are the drives in the brain? And so on. And so my dream research was about all of that. And um, now we've learnt uh, some of the things I've already said in this webinar a great deal about what repressed predictions are where they are in the brain. Uh, they have to do with the basal ganglia, the amygdala, the cerebellum, these subcortical memory structures. And now we can study empirically using methods like PET imaging and fMRI. Uh, we can see what's going on in the brain during dreaming sleep. I mean, this is what I mean by the, the value of these translations. Um, it's not just a matter of turning psychoanalytic language into another language. Uh, neuroscientific language. It's making psychoanalytic concepts available to the methods of the neurosciences. And so after making these translations, it becomes possible to test our theories using neuroscientific methods. And um, as much as I said earlier, 
that we need to revise various aspects of our theory. The one aspect of our theory that my research shows we do not need to revise is dream theory. It is the most gratifying confirmation um, of, the, of, the, of, of the most basic uh, um, uh, hypotheses, uh, namely that dreams are, uh, are uh, attempts to fulfill uh, repressed wishes, uh, and that the, these attempts are in the service of trying to protect sleep. Um, this is what the evidence shows, that this is exactly what's going on. Um, so I, 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 I don't think I'm answering the question so much as just laying the groundwork for an answer. I, I can't answer it better in, in the brief time available to us than to say that, um, remember what I said earlier, that automatized predictions, um, uh, the, the problem with automatized predictions is that they can't come to consciousness, the, these non-declarative ones, uh, and the value of them coming to consciousness is that there you can problematize them. In working memory, you can think uh, of new solutions. You can make choices rather than be compelled to repeat. And um, the most important thing about dreaming is it's conscious. This is the most striking feature of dreaming, that while you're asleep and unconscious, you have conscious experiences. So uh, this is a deep hint as to what dreaming is for. It's for bringing things to consciousness uh, in order to uh, try to deal with the problem that they represent, the need that they represent. Um, so this, is, this links psychoanalytic theory to a whole lot of empirical work on dreams as problem solving and dreams as memory consolidation, which is really just to say the same thing. Consolidating what you've learned today um, is, to, is to consolidate your new predictions. Um, and there's much that we learn in every day uh, that we can't consolidate. Uh, you know, there, there's, you, you learn an enormous amount every day. You don't consolidate at all. Uh, and it's, the process of consolidation has to do with reconciling your new predictions with your old ones. Now, this is where repressed predictions come into the picture. They are almost always going to be contradicted by new experience because they are repressed predictions which are not actually realistic. They are wishes. They are fantasies. They are how the child thinks the world works, which isn't how it really works. So we have conflict between new learning and repressed predictions. And this has everything to do with dream consciousness. And I'm afraid there's no time to say more uh, than that. But it's a very important uh, topic. Um, following this idea, uh, there's one question. Could you please explain how infantile amnesia fits into your theory? So, um, the w when you say my theory, um, please mm -hmm. remember this is not just me. Um, there's many of us working um, in neuropsychoanalysis. And what is more, there are many of us working in the same area as neuropsychoanalysis who aren't themselves uh, in any way involved in psychoanalysis. Uh, so there's, there's uh, the, the study of infantile amnesia is something that, that uh, many people uh, are, are, are doing, many of them who with, with very little involvement with psychoanalysis. However, um, one of the researchers um, who is doing cutting edge uh, work on infantile amnesia is Cristina Alberini. Uh, Cristina Alberini is a memory researcher of the highest caliber. Um, she's at NYU, um, and she is my co-chair of the Neuropsychoanalysis Society, and she's an analyst and a bench neuroscientist. So um, uh, this is why I'm wanting to make sure that uh, our colleagues understand the work happening in this area is not just me. Um, and so uh, that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that um, like with so much else in neuropsychoanalysis, in other words, as we have subjected psychoanalytic concepts to neuroscientific study, so we've learned that many things um, turn out to be more complex than they appeared. Like, for example, there isn't one thing called the unconscious. Uh, there are, in fact, multiple unconscious memory systems, each of which works in a different way. Um, now, this is relevant to the question of infantile amnesia because the conscious memory systems, or should I say the pre-conscious memory systems, 
uh, that is to say declarative memory as we call it nowadays um, in the first three years of life the declarative memory systems have not matured so uh, but the non-declarative ones the unconscious ones are functioning from the beginning from the very beginning in fact even before you're born you're laying down uh, non-declarative uh, uh, memories um, so this is why, for example, the newborn baby responds differently to its mother's voice than anybody else's voice, because it's already become familiar with that voice in utero. But it's not consciously thinking, oh, I remember that, that's my mum's voice. Gosh, you know, I like her. Uh, nothing of the kind. Remember, these are just response patterns. So you're acquiring response patterns during the first three years of your life that you can never remember. It's not possible to remember them because they're not laid down in the form of representations. Uh, in other words, declarative memories. They lay down in the form of motor responses. So they embodied memories. They are enacted memories. They're never remembered reminiscences. Um, so the core of infantile amnesia is those first three years cannot be brought to mind. Now remember, Freud said they repressed. Uh, so this is where we have to differ from Freud and say there's nothing, it's not that these predictions are pushed out of mind, it's that they, they, they never could come into mind in the first place because they're not in the nature of mental representations, they're not mentalizable uh, in and of themselves. The only way that we can become aware of them is transference again and remember that this, because they are laid down so early, doesn't mean they're not important. Take, for example, attachment. Um, we know that the human infant attaches over the first six months of its life. In other words, we know that attachment happens two and a half years before declarative memory becomes possible. So your attachment style, in other words, the predictions that you lay down in earliest infancy as to who to attach uh, to and, and, and how, to retain uh, the attachment figure's uh, uh, um, uh, presence, um, these things are laid down in, in, invariably. Uh, in fact, uh, in fact, by definition, they're laid down unconsciously. Um, and what we call it repressed. Uh, it's only repressed in the sense that some of these predictions are not the best of predictions. Imagine, for example, uh, that you. Uh, the attachment figures available to you are your mum and your dad. They're the only two who are around. What if your mum is uh, is profoundly depressed and your dad is an alcoholic, violent uh, uh, ruffian? Um, you've got to choose which one of these two am I going to attach to? Uh, your choices are between a rock and a hard place. Uh, so you attach to a hard place, a depressed mother. Uh, then this becomes your 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 prediction, your style of how you relate in all of your attachments from then onwards uh, is determined by this, these early unrememberable events and, 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 uh, and indelible, uh, indelibly uh, encoded uh, response patterns. So it's not entirely wrong to say they're repressed. In other words, they will give rise to affects um, which uh, will be in the form of mental suffering, uh, that they will give rise to transferences in the form of repetitions, which in the way that we discussed earlier are analyzable. But it's not the same way in, as Freud uh, originally understood it. Um, so that's the uh, one uh, core feature of infantile amnesia. I'll just say one last thing about infantile amnesia, which is that they are in addition, after the first three years, there are things which are repressed in the traditional way. In other words, things which were represented, um, but which overwhelmed the child uh, and which the child, problems the child could not solve, like, dear Andrea, like the Oedipus complex. None of us can solve that. <laughs> so we all of us repress it. Uh, and so this also goes under the heading of infantile amnesia. Uh, and this is what I mean when I say we find with the advances in our research that things which looked like one thing turn out sometimes to be two things or three things or more. And this is and this is good to, to, to learn how it really works. Thank you.
Okay, Mark, there is a question. Um, if you have studied the influence of psychiatric medications in those processes you have explained. Well, I'm very glad to have this question. Um, I said earlier in this webinar that um, the, the, the reasons why we must, uh, we must integrate psychoanalytic and neuroscientific knowledge is not only so that we can draw on what they've learned in neuroscience, but also so that we can teach neuroscientists what we've learned in psychoanalysis. And once we know um, that we're talking about the same thing using different words, uh, then this kind of dialogue becomes possible. Um, in the case of, um, of psychopharmacology, um, everything we've learned about the basic emotional drives, um, we've learned, remember that there are seven of them, and we've learned their anatomy, and we've learned their history. So we've gained a very important insights, not only into what the basic emotional motivating forces are in the psychology of the mind, we've also gained, at the same time, very valuable knowledge about uh, those very same things in terms of their chemistry. So I said to you earlier, our patients come to us and they say, uh, I've got this feeling, can you please take it away? Um, this conscious feeling I'm suffering from. The analyst's answer, not in so many words, is I I'm afraid we need to find out what's causing that feeling. Um, what's causing that feeling is a repressed prediction. And the, if we can change that, what you're doing that's causing that feeling, uh, then the feeling will go away. Uh, you can't just take the feeling away. The psychopharmacologist will say, you want that feeling taken away? Sure, take this drug. Okay, and uh, please note that's symptomatic treatment. It's not causal treatment. It's such a misconception in the mind of the public that psychotherapy is just fluffy stuff and drugs are like real treatment. In fact, drugs are symptomatic treatment. Uh, psychoanalysis is causal treatment. So this is the kind of thing that we clarify, but also that, we, that we under, we, we've made really important contributions, for example, to the understanding of the pharmacology of depression. Because I'm not saying that drugs are bad. Symptomatic treatment can save lives. Um, like, for example, in suicidal depression, you don't take the patient into analysis uh, and, and wait for, for, for four years for the things to get better. You know, the patient can die. So symptomatic treatments... Patients who are so depressed they can't come to analysis. Patients who are psychotic, etc. There's a very important place for psychopharmacology. But to break down the dichotomy between the two so that we can actually understand, like, for example, in depression, we, from, from neuropsychoanalytic research, uh, can show that Freud's intuition um, that melancholia is a pathological form of mourning, in other words, that depression is a pathological form of grief. We can show empirically, neuroscientifically, yes, the brain mechanisms of depression are the brain mechanisms of attachment bonding. And the, this, uh, the, the, these circuits, these uh, drives have chemistries. So the, 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 the chemical that drives separation stress more than anything else is mu opioids. It's a, it's a kind of, it's a peptide, neuropeptide. Um, and the standard treatment for depression is serotonin. So serotonin, we know from neuroscientific research, serotonin is not specific to depression. Serotonin is a very general mollifier. This is why you can give SSRIs for depression and for OCD and frankly for common unhappiness. You know, it's, it's not an antidepressant, which is also why the results are so disappointing with, with the SSRIs. So through this sort of research we showed where you should be looking is to the mu opioid receptors and an analyst um, named Yoram Yovel in Tel Aviv, um, well in fact I think he's in Jerusalem, um, he based on this hypothesis which goes all the way back to mourning and melancholia did a study where we saved lives through mu opioid treatment through a drug called buprenorphine of suicidal depressions. So I'm just giving you examples of, uh, yes, indeed, uh, the, the understanding of these systems has enormous implications for psychopharmacology, 
um, and breaks down barriers in both directions. Oh, I have good news, Mark. Uh, there is a psychoanalytic candidate question. Uh, he says, can you recommend a book seminar summarized in the seven drives? And there is also another question about uh, your summary article that you mentioned before. Uh, if where can, can it be found? Uh, so, so um, first of all, uh, the question about the seven drives. Um, the best book to read, the best thing to read is a book because it's actually a lot of knowledge. Um, the, 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 there's a, 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 the, the standard book on these seven drives is, is by Jak Panksepp, P-A-N-K-S-E-P-P, -E and it's called Affective Neuroscience, Affective, like an emotion, Affective Neuroscience. But that's a very technical book. Um, there's another book written by Panksepp and Biven, B-I-V-E-N, uh, Panksepp and Biven, she's a psychoanalytic psychotherapist. Um, and this was written specifically for um, non-specialists. And um, the title of that book is Archaeology of Mind. Panksepp and Biven, 2013, I think it is, Archaeology of Mind. But now I want to say something. Uh, Jak Panksepp, who's now deceased, was a very dear friend of mine. I love him. Uh, but he's a neuroscientist who works with rats, okay? He's not a psychoanalyst. And so at the end of the book, he makes some wild speculations about psychotherapy, which please just ignore them. Uh, he's, he, as much as he knew about the brain, he didn't know anything about psychoanalysis. So um, it, it, the recommendations he makes at the end about psychotherapy, that's like, it's like, uh, 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 one of our members making recommendations about brain surgery. You know, it's not our field. Uh, so he made the mistake there of speculating. So ignore the last chapter. Otherwise, that's the best book to read. Um, when you asked about my own, um, that's the best book to read about the seven emotional drives. Uh, when you asked about my own summary paper, do you mean the one in the British Journal of Psychiatry? Yes, I uh, so, think he's. Yeah, so that's in the international edition of the British Journal of Psychiatry, and it was 2018, um, and it's called The Scientific Standing of Psychoanalysis. Um, and I'll tell you something interesting. It was the most cited um, article in the, in the journal that year. So you see the psychiatrists read it, uh, which is good. But um, the... There's another um, general uh, introduction to this whole area that I wrote, um, which is a journal called Frontiers in Behavioral Neuroscience. Frontiers in Behavioral Neuroscience. And that article, uh, which is 2019, I think. Um, no, it's 2018. 2018. Um, the title is Neurobiological Underpinnings of psychoanalytic theory and therapy. Neurobiological underpinnings of psychoanalytic theory and therapy and the journal is Frontiers in Behavioral Neuroscience. Now, the good thing about that article is it's open access. That's the, the good thing about Frontiers is that they are, they, their journals are open access. So all that you need to do is just Google the word Psalms, neurobiological underpinnings, and boom, there's the article. And you can read it for free on your on your uh, computer. Thank you, Mark. Once again, uh, this has been a very clarifying and insightful experience. But I know that several will agree that it shows us all the work which still needs to be done in this new and innovative field. Please stay signed on to view some quick announcements on upcoming webinars and activities. Uh, we will have the next upcoming webinar on Sunday 26. And uh, um, there is no more time, I'm sorry, uh, to, to go on with other questions. Um, um, Excuse me, I'm working. Can you leave it? Um, and then, um, sorry. <laughs> The next webinar will be on um, uh, this uh, panel will be Stefano Bolognini, Claudio Neri, Jenny Valli, uh, and the moderator Robert Goises. 
um, it will be titled Post-COVID-19. Um, we also uh, need to address that we have COVID-19 resources. You can visit the website, the IPA website, and participate in discussions about the impact of COVID-19. And uh, when we will have the IPA Vancouver Congress in 2021, and the call for proposals has been extended uh, August 13th. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, I need to address also that uh, the conference is um, recorded, so you can see it at the IPA webpage because we have had some sound problems. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks, dear colleagues. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Uh, Thanks again, Andrea. For you.